this was about as bizarre and as easy as it gets. So the number for me was a number that would allow me to never have to work. I feel like we got top, top, top. I went from a sale of you know five hundred thousand dollars to in debt. One hundred ninety-two million dollars. This is Built to Sell Radio with your host John Warlow. So once a year, you go to the doctor, right? They take your blood pressure, maybe they prick your finger and they take a little blood and they give you a sense of your cholesterol level. Maybe if you go to one of those fancy healthcare facilities, they get you to run on a treadmill for a while, see how your heart's doing. You get a checkup. The same thing should be true of your business. When we look at your business through the Value Builder score, we're going to look at it through eight key drivers that acquirers care about. Whether you want to sell your business immediately or in 10, 20 years from now, these are the eight factors that business buyers care about. Knowing them now will help you maximize the value of your business going forward. Just go to valuebuilder.com and take the questionnaire. Hey, next up is Tom Pasillo, who sold Alinean to Mediafly. So I don't know if you've ever wondered, you know, when's the right time to sell and you know, thinking about maximizing value, timing the market. Well, my next guest had a life event hit them between the eyes, and that caused him to want to sell his company. And it caused me to reflect personally on just the journey we all go through as entrepreneurs and how much we give to our companies and how sometimes we need to reprioritize and get an awful reminder of that. Tom will tell you the whole story. He'll also go into how you compare valuing consulting revenue versus your recurring revenue. He partnered and sold to an existing partner, and he did that very quickly um, for reasons he'll describe. And it reminded me of how much existing partners can be great places to look for acquirers. He'll also talk about the definition of evolved selling. And he'll share with you one thing he wished he'd do, he'd done differently had he had the chance to sell his company all over again. Here to tell you his entire story is Tom Pasillo. Tom Pasillo, welcome to Build to Sell Radio. Oh, thanks. Thank you for having me. I love the picture behind you. Tell me, we were talking offline about who it is. And, uh, yeah, Alexandra Nikita. She was at the time a very young artist and was known as the Petite Picasso. So this is a uh, one of her, her paintings. And I collect uh, religious art. Uh, oh, really? A lot of uh, religious-inspired art, uh, Russian icons, uh, Spanish colonial santos and retablos wow. and things like that. Just... Uh, things that I found on my uh, travels throughout the world and growing up as a, a good Catholic boy from Long Island, Italian-American heritage. Um, those images were instilled in me at a very young age and uh, are part of my household now. Fantastic. If you're listening uh, and not watching on YouTube, the picture behind Tom is a beautiful, shocking red and pink and yellow, and it's a big, bold picture, and it's very energetic and inspiring. So great stuff. So Tom, tell me about this company um, that you sold, Alinean. Yes, which is Spanish for alignment. And uh, what we did was we were basically helping sellers to and marketers to better communicate and quantify differentiating value to prospects. Now, what does that mean? We developed in the beginning return on investment, total cost of ownership, diagnostic assessment tools that you could use with buyers interact with them, collect a little bit of data, and it would create the business case, the financial justification, the health check and diagnostics to motivate buyers to change and inspire them to purchase your solution because there's a high cost of nothing and there's a good value of change. And and what was your business model? Who did you sell this tool to? Or yeah, we sold to? it to uh, marketers and uh, sales uh, leaders. Uh, there's groups within organizations now called value engineers. And it was mostly to B2B, business to business providers. Uh, so companies like IBM, well. ADP, um, HP Enterprise, uh, Equifax. Uh, we had about 60 customers when we sold the company. And let me try to make sure I understand. So I'm, I'm a big company mm-hmm. uh, and I would use your tool as almost like a market research tool with prospects no, more, to learn. more interactively with them. So okay. let's say you were um, Microsoft and you wanted to cost justify the move to the cloud and Azure 
you would use a calculator such as what we designed to communicate and quantify the value of why move to the cloud uh, if you're Microsoft, same thing at Amazon. Uh, if you've got a new solution that's coming out or a new process improvement you want to implement and software that would help with that process improvement like ADP, why should you outsource all of your human capital management, your HR, to a company like ADP? Why outsource your payroll? It's going to cost more, right? Well, no. Once you tally up all the costs, it's actually less expensive. Nice. You save money and you're able to focus on the things you want. And it's hard for a seller to both communicate and quantify that value. So with a couple of simple questions of the prospect, they put it in the tool, press a button, and it creates a presentation, a value story. And then with another press of a button, it creates a sense of business case report that then they can pass around to the CFO, to the executives to cost justify, financially justify the solution in to the prospect. That's so cool. And so what was the business model? You were licensing this, these tools to big companies? Yeah, we would consult with these companies on, well, what is your value proposition? How do you tell the story around it? And then how do you quantify it? So there's quite a bit of consulting on the front end. And then what we would do is we had a platform where we could embody that into this platform and a piece of software that then gets licensed as a service. And then we would license that for website use, uh, self-service off of the web for customers, and then also license it to sellers. How did you convince people to buy the software? Because there's part of me that says, okay, Tom, I'll buy your consulting for sure, mm -hmm. but haven't I already kind of paid for you already when I pay for your consulting? How, like, what, like, how did you sell them the software and the consulting, I guess? Yeah, we were in the end, in fact, we were doing it almost all as a service. So it would be just an annual recurring service. And we'd have follow on, um, we'd keep the tool up to date. We'd have ongoing services to help them to make sure everything stayed relevant in terms of the story and the metrics. So that was part of the way we convinced it. And the other way we convinced them to buy just in general was, we ate our own dog food, so we would have business case tools for our own software to cost justify our solutions into to their organization and prove that by paying us some monthly, uh, I mean, a quarterly fee um, and amortizing the consulting over that life cycle and just signing up as a license, it would be cheaper and better to do that with us. So tell me how, how, kind of, how big you got the company before the triggering event that made yeah, you want to sell. not so big. This has been a niche that I've been working on for a long time. Um, I created my first company in this space, a company called Interpose in the early 90s. And I sold that to Gartner Group and we had a hmm. really successful exit. And in fact, we built that business with Gartner's brand name to over 30 million in a pretty short amount of time. So that was hmm. a great um, kind of tuck in that we did within Gartner. But they never did scale that business. And so we realized there was an opportunity once the non-competes ran out there, the bursting of the tech bubble occurred in 2001. That's when we reformed as Alinean and pretty much tackled the same kind of business again, um, trying to do cost justification and value communication and quantification tools for prospects. So we got this company up to about $4 million in revenue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, at one point, as high as six with consulting and everything else, but we were never able to break through that plateau. And when we look at the competitors in our industry, there's only a handful of them. They, too, have struggled to break out of that kind of sub 10 category. There's What's not a lot of. Yeah, there's not a lot of capital being invested in it. So there's been some venture rounds. We took a small round from Stonehenge Capital and Grace Venture Partners. Mm -hmm. um, and that was just a series A, and no one else has gone beyond series A or friends and family funding in our space. So part of it is the money is not there, uh, and it's hard to convince companies that this, or investors, that this is a big enough uh, market opportunity yet uh, for more institutional investing. Mm, it fully sat behind other sales initiatives and other marketing initiatives, and that's been part of the challenge. So what we realized was we were definitely growing, but we were behind sales enablement as the next big thing. So when you think in terms of enabling sellers, CRM was big. That was amazing. Then we had marketing automation. So companies like Eloqua, Marketo, Pardot, those guys had their run. A lot of money came into that market. They grew those uh, lead nurturing systems, marketing automation platforms big. Pardot is now part of Salesforce. 
Marketo went public and got bought. Uh, Eloqua is now part of Oracle. So mm -hmm. all of those companies got big. They went public. They got acquired by the big boys. Then the next wave now is sales enablement. And we're about to see our uh, probably the first company in the space go public here within you know, depending on the markets, which are not that great right now for IPOs, you know, six months, maybe a year to public. And there's a lot of money being placed, a lot of bets being placed. We always in this value selling, value marketing kind of space sat way behind that. Mm -hmm. And so there really was not enough um, critical mass in terms of customers, critical mass in terms of financing. And it was a few of us industry leaders and innovators that were working with other innovative companies, these early adopters to kind of implement this, but it has not institutionalized. So what we figured was why not instead cast our lot with one of these sales enablement companies that already was at a series B ready to raise a series C and be part of something bigger. And that was one of the big motivations for me was how do I personally become not just another niche play that I sell for a little bit, but how do I tag along with something that could become much, much bigger, perhaps a public exit or an exit to a major player uh, in the CRM space? Why was that important to you personally? Yeah, I'm, you know, my new title is chief evangelist, and that kind of goes, goes along with the religious art and everything. But I, I love to be on a big stage. I was a musician when I was younger. I played in wedding bands on Long Island. I was on, I had a radio show on Long Island um, during uh, my high school days. And so I always like to perform as part of um, what I do, even though I went to school for engineering, electrical engineering, um, hmm. I still love to be out in front of people. I love to uh, spread a quote unquote religion around, um, you know, sales enablement and around value selling. I have different methodologies that I've created that I want to have a bigger audience and a bigger influence on. So that's always been a big motivator for me is how do I influence and create a market. And this was a way to get some of the tools and the resources and great minds along with me to help to do that in a much, much bigger way. So where does it go from there? You realize you want to play on a bigger kind of stage. Was there a trigger that that yeah so yeah. so the positive was that so the negative was is we were in a little bit of a niche space and it was mm -hmm. really struggling to grow out of that niche the positive was that we're adjacent to this really uh incredible space that's highly competitive and the companies that are in that space are looking to differentiate and desperate for differentiation. They're all knife fight in a phone booth kind of deals that they're going through. So, <laughs> I love that. But the big trigger for me was a, a life changing event. And um, so the sad part is, is that two years ago, I lost my wife of 20 years and oh, she so was a that. partner in the business. Yeah. And so when you go through a life changing event like that, you know, it, because she was played a vital role in the business as well, running operations and marketing, as she got sick uh, through uh, cancer, it was actually a seven-year battle with breast mm -hmm. and then brain cancer. You know, it was uh, hard to maintain the focus on family and her health and well-being at the same time as the business. So we were struggling there for a while with that attention. And then once she passed, I just realized, look, I need to focus on the family first and foremost. I can't be responsible to, we had 16 people at the time. So that was 16 families that were part of the family. I, need, I needed someone to help take care of that mm -hmm. so I could focus on my two daughters who are now uh, 21. One is in uh, Pepperdine. Hmm, and uh, 16, yeah, a great cross-country runner. So um, oh, wow, they great. needed to be much more of my focus, and I couldn't have the responsibility for everything anymore. And I think there's, you know, I'm sure there's many entrepreneurs out there who've gone through that kind of personal realization. And then my goals kind of changed. I needed to focus a little bit more on my health and my my wellness to be there for the girls and realize that, you know, the these kind of um, entrepreneurial pursuits can be all-consuming and sometimes take you away from some of the things that are important. Now, that hasn't changed my motivation at all. Um, I'm still very motivated. I still have a mission. I still have a huge purpose on the business side. But I also realized that it was all consuming and that I needed to make sure that my purpose wasn't solely around the business and particularly, you know, some of the monetary and more um, selfish gains that, that were motivating me there. So it was really a little bit of an awakening that occurred through that, that process. And one where I realized 
I needed to have other people along with me on this journey and to take care of some of the things so that I could focus on the things in the business that I loved. And then certainly my myself and my personal uh, growth and spiritual growth and then my family as well. Well, thank you so much for sharing that difficult time. I think it's, um, uh, it is a, uh, it's not a, something we talk about a lot as entrepreneurs. Yeah. Right? We always talk yeah. about valuation and all, you know, but uh, it, it, it's uh, good of you to share because I know for a lot of people that is something um, that many people are going through the, the weight of running a company and how it affects their personal life. And so, uh, yeah, absolutely. Understand. And it doesn't give you a lot of time for many, many other things. So, you know, sometimes yeah. it's good to, to stop and realize that, Hey, there are other paths and other ways to get there. Like I said, I'm still, super motivated, uh, still doing uh, as much, if not more in some ways than, than before. But uh, balance is also really, really important. So where does it go from there? You have this life-changing event. Mm-hmm. Uh, did What was the next step? Did you have someone waiting in the wings looking to buy the business? Did you take we it didn't. to market? We had people, uh, you know, kicking the tires. I had taken it to market maybe seven or eight years before. Didn't like mm-hmm. the process that we went through. Um, and didn't think there were a lot of companies who would be ready to consume us. So we wound up having a partner, a company that called us up. Uh, We were recommended by a a mutual friend of ours to talk to each other, Uh, Michael Jorberg. He was working at uh, Salesforce out of Chicago, a great uh, connector. There are these people out there that just love connecting different uh, like-minded kindred spirits together. Mm -hmm. Uh, We liked the company right away. We partnered together on a couple of deals right away and won them business and they won us business almost Tell me about this company. This is Mediafly? Yeah, this is Mediafly. And what did Uh, they do? Yeah, they're a sales enablement platform company. So content management is the main focus of what they did. So the ability for sellers to find and locate the right content, the ability for marketers to publish the right content out to sellers, and then put rules around it so there's recommendations of what's the best piece of content to use when and where and how with a buyer. And then they had this extra piece, which was how do we change the engagement, that last mile, that moment of truth when we're sitting in front of a customer to not use PowerPoint, but to use something more rich and dynamic, like an interactive application. And then that's where we come in because we're another interactive application that can fit in there. So we did a project for one of their customers called Sealed Air, and it was a cost justification tool that would have taken them months and months of custom programming, be too expensive for the customer to buy at scale, and we were able to implement it in a week, what took them months. Um, and then we were able to get another deal and another deal together. And it was just, it was fun working with them. I saw that I could have a really good um, stage presence and they didn't have someone like me on the organization. Uh, and we were just a fit. So it really wasn't that we were seeking an acquisition then, although I had bought my investors out and wanted to make sure that I had kind of a it was moving towards an exit. I wasn't really pursuing it in earnest and it kind of just kind of came to us. Um, so who raised the specter of an acquisition? Because you're, you're going with Mediafly, you're going into kind of these pitches, uh, Mediafly is using you as their sort of killer app to, to, yeah, to yeah, in, a, in, a, in a Coke Pepsi kind of battle. Mm-hmm. Uh, who, who sort of, who, who made the first move? They did, yeah, which I always like to do. I mean, they kind of knew that I would be considering it, especially because of the life events that had occurred, Mm -hmm. um, which had only occurred a year prior to us partnering. Uh, So um, Carson, the CEO, um, they had never done an acquisition before. Uh, He said, would you be open to pursuing this? I don't know if I can get it through the board or not. Uh, Let's make a run at it. And I'm like, yeah, we love working with you guys, which was my biggest criteria in it. Um, Let's see if we can work something out. And we were able to do that. So does Carson comes to you with an offer of some sort? Was that the um, first He step? came with a framework. Yeah, a framework of an offer. It wasn't uh, every I dotted, T crossed in terms of all the terms, but it was close enough. Uh, we took that to the board, got some temperature uh, of them. I didn't to have a clear, board at the time. You, I was, was going to say, you yeah. took it to the media flat yeah, board. I took it to their board, yeah. I had got bought it. my board out and kind of took it all private ahead of uh, the life-changing events that I went through. Um, okay. It was just appropriate because the business wasn't growing through that period. And so you're, 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 you're 4 million in revenue. Um, 
What was the split between, uh, if you can share, uh, sort of consulting versus recurring or licensing fees uh, on the floor? Yeah, it was more like, consulting than licensing fees. It was about 40 licensing, 60 consulting. Okay. And so did you have a sense of what you thought it was worth? Yeah. In, yeah. And it came out to be just about that. And um, how did you arrive at that? at that valuation. I think people, I, I know we can't talk about the exact number. Yeah, there's, there's multiples out there in terms of, you know, what is consulting revenue worth? Uh, what is um, annual recurring revenue worth? And the multiples were along the lines of those typical uh, multiples. Um, and were you, if you're a were smaller you company, it's discounted more. If you're a larger company, it's, you know, it's, um, and, and uh, growth plays into that. So those are the two other kind of mitigating factors that I encourage entrepreneurs to consider. Uh, you know, if you're a smaller company, but you're rapidly growing, that's worth more, but you're a smaller company. And when you're looking at evaluation compared to a larger company, there's a, a kind of a collateral discount that occurs on the other end of that. Uh, if you're not growing, you know, then there's discounts that occur there. If you're growing quickly, then there's multiples that, that kick in. So those were some of the parameters that we were kind of playing with as we came up with the valuation. So in your mind, uh, you were, were you, when you came up with your own sort of valuation, mm -hmm. independent of Carson, were you, uh, were you placing a higher value on the recurring Yes. Fee oh, than you were the consulting? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Like, would you, would it be like 2X? Uh, um, you know, usually the range on recurring revenue is anywhere from three on the low end to kind of six, seven on the higher oh. end. I, there are some that are more than that that are out there, mm. but um, those are, that's rarefied air. Um, yeah. And then, you know, consulting revenue could be anywhere from, I mean, I've seen in all my experience and I've, I've been involved in a lot of different acquisitions, different companies I've had pieces of, anywhere from a quarter on the dollar to one and a half maybe on the dollar. So mm -hmm. that'll give you an idea of kind of where to, where to kind of look for. And again, the mitigating factors are how big are you um, compared to the other company? Um, are you growing? Are you not growing? Um, and then overall that mix, the recurring revenue, the subscription revenue is still worth a lot more. Although we're seeing that get discounted a little bit, you know, as the WeWork IPO kind of struggles, as some of these newer IPOs struggle, mm. uh, I think the days of kind of, you know, there was some seven and eight X multiples on SaaS. I, you know, I don't think those days are here anymore. Mm -hmm. um, Sandhill.com is a good resource to go and look at for recurring revenue valuations. And there are other uh, sources out there. But um, there's, there's good metrics, I think, that are floating around. I just encourage entrepreneurs to be uh, a little bit cognizant that there is discounting going on in the SaaS multiples today. Um, mm -hmm. A year ago, it was a little bit different. Three years ago, it was way different. Uh, but today, they're under a little bit of pressure. Got it. So you, you've got a sense of what you think the business is worth. Carson comes to you with an offer. Um, what was your reaction to the offer? Um, it was good. Uh, I was ready to sell. I think that's the first thing um, as an entrepreneur. You know, if you're ready, I think it makes it easier. Mm -hmm. um, we did a quick check to see if there was any other um, low-hanging fruit out there of companies Meaning other, that might other be buyers. Yeah. yeah, I think that's always prudent to do. Um, if I didn't have some of the life motivation that I had, I might have even run a process, at least a mm -hmm. quick one formally at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But we had put some feelers out on terms of different strategies. At the time, it was either raise our own Series B and go big, um, you know, find a partner like Carson to partner with, with an um, kind of a, almost an acquisition hire type uh, acquisition that we did where we can fold in and we can then be uh, participating in the growth of that company um, or kind of get um, kind of a strategic buyout from another company. And there just weren't that many strategic buyers in our space. You know, again, it's, mm -hmm. it, it was rather, it's not a well-defined space. We were pioneers in it with maybe one or two other companies and it just wasn't a lot of out of the gate interest. I think it's something that had to be nurtured almost like what we did with Carson and his team and proven so that the risk was off the table. How did you, how did, 
how did he sort of de-risk the deal from his end? I'm assuming there was some sort of earnout or structure, mm-hmm. and that is exactly how we did it. Yeah, it it was very much on the earnout side to make sure that we still contributed to the growth. And on the other side too, we were pretty interested in that as well. You know, some money was definitely taken off the table, but a lot of it was you know we believed in that organization and we knew what we could contribute. Uh, I knew what I could do from a bigger stage. Um, my team knew what we could do if we had some more resources. So we weren't afraid to let it ride. And we also had more money uh, to play with, more investors and a professional private equity firm instead of a, a venture capital firm to back the being, organization, being with media. Being media, media exactly. Yeah. Can you give us a sense? Of, and again, if you can, I understand, but can you give us a sense um, what proportion of the deal was sort of at risk versus kind of what you got up front? Yeah. Talk um, about that? About, about, at broad strokes even. Yeah, about 40, 60. Uh, okay. 40 kind of up front, 60 kind of earn out back end. And how did you, how did you get comfortable uh, with that? Mm-hmm. Obviously, you've done a couple of deals with Mediafly, so you knew them. Yep. But was there any other due diligence that you did to make sure that that earnout piece was, was going to happen? Yeah. Um, first of all, you never know, um, mm. right? So uh, diligence, we definitely looked at the deals that they had, the customers they had. We were involved in co-selling right along with them. That was good. Um, I think with, it, with any organization that you partner with, there's always... Um, I wouldn't say surprises, but things that you find out afterwards on both ends that you just have to manage. So you just have to make sure you're aware of that. Um, the good news with us is we immediately got hired uh, as part of the team. All of our team was made, was retained. And in fact, we've added to it substantially. So we're growing the business substantially within the MediaFly family, which is Fantastic. awesome. Um, was which the was the biggest surprise? Part of what I wanted to do. Yeah. What was the biggest surprise? How, how even more competitive their marketplace was than what mm. I knew going in. I already knew it was competitive, but it is, when I say a knife fight in a phone booth, um, <laughs> many, many of the deals they're involved with, um, the companies that are involved have all taken much bigger rounds, um, which means that they're more well-financed, they can discount more and things like that, but they're also at risk and they've got to get these deals quick. Mm. So they tend to be very difficult RFPs when you're at that stage to win the deals. So what we've had to do was make sure that, and this is a big contribution of my evangelism as well as our organization, that we've got a different almost playing field that we created that we're competing on. Uh, So it's been a substantial contribution that, I don't think we understood would be as important. And maybe, you know, if I were negotiating today, knowing that I probably could get more. Um, Mm. But, you know, going in, um, we didn't realize how competitive that was. So that was kind of the one surprise is that, um, you know, where where I think a more substantial part of the differentiation in the business than we ever imagined we would be, and Mm. also a bigger contributor in a lot of ways than we would have been. Um, Mm -hmm. And I don't think I value that 100%, but at the same time, these are things that you don't know going in. You know, mm-hmm. uh, Other than that, they've fulfilled on all of the promises. The team has been retained. Um, we've all, we're all doing jobs that we love. If someone's in a job that they aren't, that they want to do something else, they've wound up finding positions for them and moving them around and giving them other career opportunities. So it's been fantastic on that front. It's great. I'm glad you brought up um, sort of the point of differentiation and the platform and and your evangelism, uh, because part of that is the book. Um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the book and and I always have a show the book? <laughs> there it is. Yeah, um, it's called Evolved Selling. It is. Um, tell you know, tell me about it and what it what it's all about. Yeah, so it's the methodology that uh, Carson had put a name to and that we combined our methods on. And it is a way to enable sellers to sell better, to move from the kind of traditional ways of pitching a product with a PowerPoint deck and paper-based collateral to now how do you digitally transform that and take the seller on a journey to make them more evolved, to sell with purpose and with value instead of just pitching. 
So from pitch to purpose is kind of what the book is about. And it's a journey and a roadmap that we created. It's a method that goes across four different men- uh, kind of um, pillars. So there's a way to inspire buyers to change. There's a way to influence them with the right material at the right time to facilitate their buying process. There's interactive tools, and then there's intelligence. And those four pillars are what essentially Evolve Selling is built around. And the best thing with the book is, for those who are online, it is a picture book. Oh, wow. And it's yeah. part of the methodology that pictures are worth a thousand words. And so it's full color pictures. It's got charts, graphs, interviews, articles. Uh, Brent Adamson from Challenger Sale, we interviewed him. We interviewed Mary Shea from Forrester. Scott Santucci, a leader in sales enablement, Tamara Shank, and other great analysts are, are all contributors in the book. And it was a way for me to kind of encapsulate all the great interviews and webcasts that I've done over the past few years with a methodology and a roadmap and put it into a simple to use guidebook for sales enablement and content marketers. And in terms of the financials, uh, was this a book you wrote prior to the deal with Mediafly or after? It is a second edition of a book that I wrote prior, but definitely was able to carve out extra time through this so that I could finish it up and wrap it up with my team. So, and create all of the great new content that needed to go into it uh, to expand the scope. Got it. And, and I'd be curious you know, I don't know why I'm curious. So tell me, to go to hell if you if, if you have to. But uh, did you retain the copyright to the book? Do you get the royalties? Does it have MediaFly property? Like, how did? I guess it's. I, I, I in seriousness, there is sort of some oh, yeah. modicum of 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 uh, method to my madness. I'm curious when an entrepreneur does an earn out. You know, there are other activities that you do, mm-hmm. speaking and writing. Is that something that, that you charge for incrementally or, or is it all roll up to Mediafly? It all rolls up to Mediafly. The royalties are separate. Um, so I get compensated for book sales and that's great. Okay. And the rights are kind of um, this exact book is theirs, but, you know, a lot of the, the methods are, are retained. Um, so... Um, yeah, it's kind of a shared a shared model. Okay. Uh, okay. You know, Evolve Selling was not my concept. It wasn't my main name. It's their trademark. I think that helped compared to the prior name of the book. So there were and the methods, several of the methods are their methods, not my methods. So it was definitely incremental in terms of a collaboration. Uh, but at the same time, I did retain individuals. I'm the sole name and author on the book. The royalties um, do come my way, which is great. And uh, yeah, so it's it's definitely a little bit of a shared model, though. Yeah, and I, there, again, the reason I ask is I, I think a lot of entrepreneurs are so used to having their their fingers in a lot of pies. Mm-hmm. Uh, they sell, and the question then becomes, well, hold on a second, is a hundred percent of your effort what did being you sell? put into the? Yeah, yeah, what did you sell? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> did you sell exactly? And a lot of us, just, you yeah. know, and that's that's a really good point because a lot of us now have personal brands, right? And when right. we sell. Um, did you sell that personal brand or didn't you? And it's important to try to rain, you know, maybe retain some of that. With me, I'm often called the ROI guy. That's kind of my Monica and my online pers- uh, persona. Um, mm. That's retained. Uh, so there were certain websites, certain things that were retained. Uh, but you've got to be careful there because you don't want it to seem to the other company like, oh, well, he's just going to be here for a year and he's got all this stuff and he's just going to bail out and go and do that. And so you have to make sure that you're, um, you're not uh, negotiating it to the point where you're not committed. I mean, either you're in these kind of earnout deals, you either commit 100% or you don't would be my advice to the entrepreneur. And you can't have a foot in both camps. It doesn't mean you can't still be building a little bit of personal brand and working on, you know, certain things and certain creativity outlets that you have. But at the same time, I think the more you can figure out how to dedicate to it. And then once you're done, you're done. And then you can move on to that next thing. That's, that's yeah. always good. So the book is called Evolved Selling, yes. uh, available, I'm assuming, anywhere you buy books. Am- Amazon's yep. probably Amazon, the best place yeah, to do it. Yeah, Amazon is the best place to do it. Yeah. Uh, in fact, we self-published it via Amazon. It was the only way oh, we okay. could kind of get the, actually the production quality that we wanted in four color, vibrant the way it is, is all on-demand printing and publishing via Amazon through the Kindle KDP program, which I'm a huge fan of. This is my second book there. And then we just recorded and wrapped up um, 
the audiobook version of it, which will be on audible.com. doesn't help with all the pictures, but it's still uh, a good listen. And uh, that'll be available here within a, a week or two. Fantastic. Um, Tom, I know people are going to want to reach out. What's the best way? Are you a Twitter guy? Are you a LinkedIn guy? What's the best way to, for people that are going to reach yeah, out? Yeah, Thomas Pacello on LinkedIn or T. Pacello on uh, Twitter. So absolutely. And I publish often on those channels. So subscribe or sign up or send me an invite and I'd love to chat. Well, it was great to meet you and thank you for doing this. Uh, I'll yeah. be picking up the book and appreciate you. you taking the time. Yeah. Good to meet you too. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Built to Sell Radio with John Warlow. For complete show notes with links to additional resources, visit builttosell.com slash blog. John is the founder of the Value Builder System. To find out how to improve the value of your business by 71%, visit valuebuildersystem.com. John is also the author of Built to Sell, creating a business that can thrive without you and the automatic customer, creating a subscription business in any industry. Connect with John at Facebook.com slash Built to Sell or on Twitter at John Warlow, W-A-R-R-I-L-L-O-W. -L -L Thanks for listening.